Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Th this is, as you all realize, it's a, it's a very important uh, panel and a very important uh, subject for all of us. I think naturally uh, each of us now is increasingly uh, aware of the implication of uh, climate change uh, related risks to uh, the uh, financial uh, system. It has, of course, implications in terms of costs. It has perhaps also implications in terms of uh, opportunities. And perhaps the big issue is whether the financial system itself, supervisors, regulators, central banks, are fully grasping the importance of the subject and uh, perhaps what they could do to address uh, these uh, uh, new types of uh, financial uh, implications and, and risks. So it is very nice to have here around the table uh, uh, our uh, colleagues that will dissert uh, on uh, the topic. Uh, I think we have about 25 uh, minutes, so it means uh, uh, for each of you about five minutes of uh, an introduction on, uh, uh, on the topic, and then we will have questions related to the, the that uh, the, the issues that were posed to the audience and continue the debate after we read your own answers to these issues. So I will start from uh, left uh, to, to right with uh, uh, Alejandro. Thank you, Luis, and uh, I'm very happy to be here and talking about such a, an important topic. First, um, I think in terms of um, climate change, uh, we would like to also talk about environmental degradation. I think especially in emerging markets, uh, environmental degradation continues to be a very serious uh, concern. So we, talk, we, we like to talk about uh, both uh, phenomena. And um, we think that they are uh, clearly challenges of, uh, of today's global economy and a, modern, to, a challenge to modern financial systems. I see this is the kind of challenge that it is more like um, medium to long term, low frequency type of phenomena. Sometimes it doesn't deserve all the attention that it should. Uh, sometimes it is not on the window for the political uh, uh, cycle to really uh, own the problem and, and the answers uh, to it. So I think that it is a challenge. Clearly it is a challenge. In, in terms of why should, should central banks be associated with this, uh, with this issue, that clearly it's a, it's a global issue and a national issue and not only um, a financial system t topic. For central banks, and especially for Banco de Mexico, we have uh, one of our objectives is to be uh, obviously associated with the sound development of the financial system. So, so this is clearly the area where we start um, having involvement and being concerned uh, about this. And when you talk about what does uh, financial stability uh, requires, uh, well, clearly that involves a lot of things. Uh, and the previous panels and the next panels will, will address so, some of those. But I think it also addresses uh, the eradication of financing and risk management practices that avoid full recognition of environmental negative uh, externalities and risks. I think that is a key problem that we have uh, are ha at hand and the relation with the financial system. And, and, and more, in a more concrete way, uh, I think that it is um, critical to have uh, knowledge about the major consequences and credit risk that we can have uh, and the implications for financial stability. And just to illustrate this point, and in the last couple of months, we have been uh, hearing about uh, significant uh, problems. I would mention one of them, uh, the California utility company, PG&E, which, uh, as you know, uh, filed for bankruptcy. And uh, it is estimated uh, that the most recent figure about this uh, uh, bankruptcy is associated with $50 billion. And as you know, these uh, liabilities were associated with uh, wildfires in California uh, in 2017 and 2018. Uh, also, uh, another example is uh, the mining company uh, Vale, the Brazilian company, which as you know, uh, it's facing uh, significant class action lawsuits uh, for uh, the dam collapse that occurred in January. And then here I think the, 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 key, the key message is how does um, climate change and environmental degradation uh, combined uh, to create serious potential credit, credit risk and how the financial system is exposed to this. And, and one of the key uh, elements is uh, we need to get the pricing uh, correct. 
And that means that financial risks, including the ones related to climate change and environmental degradation, need to include uh, in the pricing of, uh, of these risks. And um, we, we are of the view that for financial systems and uh, in order to have sustainable uh, development and sound financial systems, we need to better disclose uh, risks, environmental risks, and uh, to have the adequate risk management tools. And the approach that um, we have uh, tried to put in place um, in, in Banco de Mexico is to try to understand this as um, literally as an ecosystem or an integral uh, issue or a problem with multi-dimensions. Uh, and I will mention four areas where I think we need a lot to, to move forward. At the institution's level, we clearly need to improve risk management practices in order to include, include these considerations and these risks. At the project finance dimension, I think we need to introduce clear standards uh, that can let uh, stakeholders know what they are uh, holding. And also uh, lending startups, standards according to uh, some of these uh, practices. In terms of uh, instruments, uh, there are a lot of uh, new instruments regarding green bonds, uh, green credit lines, uh, developing uh, a green asset class, and introducing new indices where people and stakeholders uh, can really uh, focus on the type of assets that they want to hold. Uh, a third dimension is regarding information. And in terms of information, we need to improve the environmental data that we have to understand better uh, the risks that we are facing. We need to develop better methodologies and uh, also uh, risk regulation and awareness about uh, these uh, sometimes hidden risks. The fact that they are uh, uh, in, in a blind spot, uh, that doesn't mean that they are not there and that they could materialize as some of the examples that I, that I mentioned. And also in terms of uh, project development, I think it is very important to have a wide array of uh, considerations regarding the environment and the, the, the climate uh, footprint of these projects and uh, to allow for a wide variety of projects uh, to be developed with these standards and that investors that are growingly aware of these issues uh, be associated uh, with, uh, with that. And uh, Mexico has been, Banco de Mexico has been uh, quite uh, engaged with the topic. We have been, uh, we are part of a uh, NGFS uh, uh, founding uh, members, and, and we are uh, we truly believe that uh, we we need to in improve our awareness, uh, and we need to have this on the radar screen to manage uh, the risks uh, properly, not only uh, the environmental risks but also the financial implications of it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank, you. thank you very much, Alejandro. So it's a, it's quite a, a broad uh, menu of uh, things that uh, central bank supervisors can do. And maybe, uh, Frank, since uh, you chair precisely the network for uh, uh, greening the uh, financial system that uh, comprises many central banks, including the Bank of uh, Mexico, what would be your sort of take on, on these issues of how regulation can help uh, to address these financial risks coming from climate change? Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Luis. And, and it's great to, to, to be here and to sit also next to you, Alejandro, and to the other panel members. Um, well, indeed, your, your question was, do we need regulation in order um, to promote green finance and to contribute to environmental objectives? And my answer to that is going to be no and yes. And I will start with the no. Um, and um, I will try to illustrate that by showing all the kind of things that we within DNB, uh, the Dutch Central Bank, have been doing, not to make this kind of like a, a pro domo speech, uh, because many of these things have been uh, done or are being done uh, also in other, um, in other institutions. Um, and I'm sure also Jeff um, uh, will talk about that in the insurance uh, sector. But it is just happens to be the institution that I know myself best. And it also um, helps in that sense that if we are doing something stupid, then at least that is our mistake. And I'm not uh, attributing that to any other um, institution. Now, DMB is also an example that is maybe useful because we are very much integrated. We are a prudential supervisor in the various sectors. We are a central bank and, um, and financial stability authority. We are economic advisor to the government. 
Uh, and we also, but that is true for all institutions, we also have convening power. And I would like to actually go briefly through these various roles and to show uh, what we have been, uh, what we have been uh, doing. All, and that is the key message for this part of my introduction, all without any changes to regulation. All these things could be done and have been done without changes in regulation. And I uh, would endeavor to say that that would probably also hold true for many of the other institutions uh, here present. Um, starting with the prudential supervisory side, uh, what we did in the pension sector already some years ago is that we did a survey of the, um, uh, the sustainable investment policies of, um, of, of, of pension funds in the Netherlands. And uh, on the basis of that survey, we published a good practices uh, kind of publication. Um, with two results. One was uh, raising awareness of the issue um, in, in the wider pension fund sector, on the one hand, and on the other hand, helping the laggards, so to speak, to learn from the front runners by you know, publishing uh, what we had learned uh, from that uh, investigation. Um, then, um, some, some time later, um, broader, not just in the pension sector, but also the banking sector and the insurance sector, we looked, uh, and this is a report you can find, which is called Waterproof, we looked at, for example, uh, the flooding risks, uh, exposures um, uh, to flooding risks uh, by uh, the various sectors uh, of the financial sector in the Netherlands. We looked, um, for example, also, uh, but there were other examples, but I will just give you these two, to um, exposures to office buildings with uh, low energy labels, uh, knowing that these will be prohibited in a certain um, uh, period of time. Now, on the basis of these and other reports and investigations that we did, as a prudential supervisor, we came to a conclusion that has now also been embraced by the broader NGFF membership, which, by the way, is more than 30 members now, and some very highly distinguished observers as well. Um, and that is that insight is that climate change, uh, the climate risks are a source of financial risk. And um, now, you might say this is a very open door, and how obvious can it get? But for a central bank supervisor to say that, um, it means that what you say is it is squarely, squarely part of our mandate. So we are mandated to talk about it because we are in the business of supervising, of thinking about um, uh, financial risks. And if then uh, this is the source of financial risk, that should be within our mandate. Now, building on that insight and still within the, um, the framework of prudential supervision, um, we thought, now, if climate change is one of the SDGs, one of the sustainable development goals, and if you could see it maybe as an SDG kind of risk, um, wouldn't then what we have just learned in climate not also be ap applicable in other SDGs? So couldn't you maybe look at biodiversity loss, at uh, resource scarcity, fresh water scarcity, maybe even, maybe even human rights, and see whether these are also sources of financial risks via the same channels as we have learned in the climate context, i.e. a transition channel, um, because governments take action, and a physical channel that I'm sure uh, Jeff will, uh, will tell upon up as well. Um, and indeed, uh, we came out with a report a couple of months ago in which we came, uh, came, came out with some preliminary data showing, indicating that indeed also these other um, 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 the, the, the SDG risks, if, if you like, uh, biodiversity loss, etc., are drivers of financial, um, financial risk. Um, last, under the heading of prudential supervision, we are now doing a, um, a project within uh, the Dutch Central Bank, which we've called New Frontier, in which we very painstakingly go through all our um, supervisory procedures and to see what we can do this, ranging from the SREP process on the one hand to fit and proper to the other on the other side and everything in between. So we're trying to actually really incorporate this in our normal processes. But we are also a central bank and a um, financial stability authority. As a central bank, we started, this is the most mundane, pragmatic thing, but I just, I just mentioned it to you. Uh, as of this year, all the uh, Euro bank notes that are being um, procured by the Dutch Central Bank uh, on, on our own behalf, but also on behalf of some of the other central banks that we procure and on behalf of, uh, will be made of 100% sustainable cotton. So it's just a small fun fact, as my daughter would call it. Um, and uh, next, uh, next, next month, we will be the first, or at least among the first, of the central banks signing the UN PRI, the Principles for Responsible Investment, um, and, and applying those to our um, own reserve management. Thus, um, um, signaling to the market uh, that, we, uh, that we think that, uh, one, this can be done, and, and, and second, that, that, that it might uh, be a good idea to do so. Um, but we have also, uh, and this is more from a financial stability point of view, um, uh, and very much, I think, in line with the former panel uh, asking for looking ahead to unknown unknowns, et cetera, 
um, we have designed and performed and also published about uh, what we call climate stress tests. Uh, now, this has been done by, uh, more widely, and I think this is still maybe a little bit for the initial stage. We need to do much more work on that. But it is a way to try to, um, to, get, to get your hand on something that is, um, that, 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 that is in the future and that is uh, amorph and difficult to grasp. As an economic advisor to the government, uh, what we have done is that we have looked at the energy transition. Um, we have looked at the exposures of the financial sector to, um, to high fossil um, um, and the sectors. Um, and in that context, and that also uh, that already goes to the second part of my, uh, my, my, my answer, which will be much shorter, by the way, um, uh, we have pleaded in that context for a climate law and for CO2 pricing. I will, I will come back to that in one second. Um, and we also, also in the heading of this economic research, um, uh, we looked at the price of transition. What would happen if there were not to be a European uh, CO2 price or tax, but if the uh, Dutch government were to go at this um, uh, all by itself? Could the Dutch um, um, economy uh, withstand such a, such a thing? And actually, we came to the conclusion that indeed uh, that would affect the economy, but not to an extent that would be uh, especially worrisome. For some sectors, it would be, but these sectors, in and on their own turn, could then be re and then compensated. Compensated to, to a certain extent by the proceeds of a carbon tax. So we, we have not pleaded that such a step be taken, uh, but we have fed into the um, to the Dutch political debate um, these kind of um, these kind of um, um, uh, facts. Um, I already mentioned we are an institution with um, convening power. When we invite people, just like the BIS and many others, they tend to come. Um, and uh, for various reasons, I can assure you. Um, and um, um, one of the things that under that heading we did is that we um, started what we now call the Platform for Sustainable Finance in the Netherlands, where we bring together the various in industry and, and associations, uh, but also some of the uh, relevant uh, ministries, the market conduct, um, uh, the, the, the supervisor, and um, the, the academia, and, uh, and us ourselves, um, um, and try to really move forward and to horizontalize, if you like, insights that are in one sector and could be shared with, um, with, another, with another sector. Uh, something which we very much do also on the global scale between uh, GFs, um, uh, SIF, and the, uh, and the NGFS. Um, because there also, this is maybe not so much a convening power, but it's the ability to cooperate also internationally, which of course we all have, uh, and that is the, uh, the NGFS. Um, which, uh, which I will just, you know, very briefly mention now. Uh, but um, uh, that, of course, this, this coalition of the willing, starting with eight members uh, a little bit uh, over a year ago, now already 30, um, um, greatly um, enhances the, um, the leverage that we have on the financial sector, of course, the time to market or the time to supervisory market, if you like, of innovations and insights that, uh, that we have, the um, intra-institutional competition there is, uh, you know, whenever the Bank of England comes up with an insight that we have not yet, we feel that we should have thought about that. So there's, there's competition among the members, which is good, which speeds things up. And, the, um, uh, and it also, you know, the, the joining forces um, enhances greatly the trillions of assets under supervision if you like, if that is a term. Um, we will come out as an NGFS uh, this April with a, um, with a uh, the full, uh, the fully fledged report, which will contain recommendations uh, that are for everyone to, uh, to be looked at. And um, um, I will be presenting this also in the supervisory board of the SSM and my, maybe also maybe in the Bauer Committee when, when, uh, when, when there would be an uh, opportunity. We also looked, and I'm, I'm, I'm getting very, uh, very much to the end, um, we also looked at our own governance. Um, so we, we added the concept of sustainability in our mission statement to act as a kind of like a compass to all our departments and all our uh, employees that they knew uh, that this is something that we, that we care about. Um, but we also um, um, formulated our own uh, overarching between all these various um, headings that I just mentioned, all these various tasks that we have, a overarching sustainable um, st strategy uh, with KPIs that are being checked by our finance department, which are being looked at by the auditors and which are being discussed by the executive board. All this, and this is the main message, without any law having been changed. All this can be done. So is there also a yes part to the question? Um, uh, is there, uh, in our view, um, a, a need for certain regulatory action? Yes, I think there is. And I will mention three, but very briefly. Um, the Paris Agreement uh, is out there, but to a certain extent, it's a very abstract thing. 
and it's difficult for, um, for, for actors in the real economy, but also for actors in the financial community, um, to, to really know what that actually will mean. So the sooner uh, national governments um, make clear by means of climate laws or climate accords or any way uh, that, uh, that, that fits within their, 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 their national habits, so to speak, um, the sooner uh, there's clarity on intermediate deadlines, on in intermediate milestones, the better it is uh, for financial stability because people would know uh, when uh, certain things would, 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 would happen. And the more um, um, measures to comply with, uh, with the Paris Agreement are being postponed, the more radical uh, government that action will uh, will likely be, and the more radical it will be, um, the more it might affect financial stability. Um, the second uh, second area where I see um, uh, room for regulation uh, would be transparency, um, uh, financial disclosures, uh, and this is of course uh, closely related also to the work that is being done in various quarters on taxonomy. And the last one, maybe the big elephant in the room, it's not for regulators to, um, to do this, but it might be for us to tell governments that it might be a good idea, and that would be the pricing of externalities and more specifically the pricing of CO2, either be it by a tax or be it in, in any other way. Uh, because if we get these incentives right, um, uh, then um, the, um, the change to a, 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 a zero emission economy will be more smooth and that will be all the better um, for the financial system. Thank you. Thank, thank you, uh, Frank. Um, so we hear so far that there is uh, information, there is uh, awareness, there are new uh, financial uh, instruments, and if they are combined, and certainly uh, uh, monetary authority can, can help to combine these instruments and, and enhance this awareness, uh, you can sort of walk the, the, uh, towards a, a, a different type of, uh, of equilibrium and certainly combat some of the uh, uh, financial risks associated with uh, uh, climate change. But, but prudential regulation is a, is a little bit more than just awareness and uh, sort of having the financial instruments available. It, it implies that you're sort of indicating a, 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 a way in which there is a bit more of a mandatory behavior that financial institutions should uh, take in order to precisely minimize the financial risks associated to uh, climate change. Now, I'm turning now to the uh, perhaps the receiving end of the bill because uh, you've been probably in the business of uh, having to cope with uh, an increased amount of events uh, that, uh, Patrick, that are related perhaps uh, to climate change. And is it something that having a regulatory framework uh, would help you to sort of accommodate uh, the way in which uh, your business uh, is conducted, or is this something that spontaneously you would, uh, by yourself, uh, be uh, in the process of already changing in terms of business uh, practices? So, so Patrick, floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for <clears throat> for having me. Um, for for us. Um, climate change has been an emerging risk some 35 years ago, and we identify, we try to permanently sort of scan the horizon, um, primarily what's happening in the scientific community, to understand how our risk profile um, might be changing. So it's, um, it's not a new risk, but it's basically um, a modification of existing risks. And um, we have tried very early on, and this is not just related to climate change, but to anything that we call sustainability, or you can call it ESG, it's roughly the same scope, to integrate it into our risk analysis. Um, so, for example, on the investment side, we have implemented ESG benchmarks. We have um, our own um, evidence tells us that risk-adjusted returns are actually superior if you apply ESG benchmarks. Nominal returns might not be superior, but risk-adjusted returns are superior. Since we operate an economic framework or risk-adjusted framework, this for us makes perfect business sense. Um, similarly, on the underwriting side, we cover um, climate-related physical risk um, for a long time. Uh, property, that's the, uh, basically the, the most visible um, events are the large 
hurricanes, the large Nat Cat events. But inter interestingly, that is an area where we have to be a little bit cautious to take it as a proof for the impact of climate change because we really can't see an increased frequency or an increased severity of events. What we see is an increased impact of these events, but that is primarily driven by vastly increased exposures. Um, if you look at uh, Ocean Drive in Miami, Florida, a picture of 1920, you will see basically an empty dam in the ocean. If you look at it now, you see skyscrapers on both sides. And that's just one sort of very um, visible um, comparison. You can do many um, of these similar comparisons. So we have to be very careful. Where we do see already now significant increase in um, loss cost and also a more problematic um, insurability is in other businesses like agriculture. Um, obviously, the, the wildfires are maybe a little bit difficult to assess because there also we have an exposure issue. Um, the most affected areas um, are areas that have been built um, o only in recent years. But um, we certainly see a change in weather, pa weather patterns. The increasing ocean temperature means more rain, more, more humidity is in the, in the air. So more rainfall, more heavy rainfall, um, which obviously combining this with um, reduced uh, smaller floodplains, um, more built uh, riverbeds, built out riverbeds, creates an exposure. Now what can insurers do with appropriate risk management, with a rational risk management? They basically can determine or assess <coughs> the right risk cost for this economic behavior. And with that, contribute to the information and hopefully also nudge um, developments into the right um, direction. For all of that, um, we don't need regulation. In fact, I, I, as a company, we would advocate um, rather don't try to use and skew prudential regulation to pursue um, a political or a social objective. Um, this is, uh, it, 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 it often is hard enough to basically meet the primary objective of prudential regulation, which is policyholder protection or, 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 or customer protection and, and, and stability protection. And if you, if you try to sort of use this to, to serve another purpose, it, it would be it would be, uh, we think, um, problematic and, and basically impossible to do, and the, the, the risk of adverse consequences or unintended consequences would be way too big. What we think is uh, much more positive and helpful um, is, if, is transparency, create transparency, create standards around transparency, so we're very much supportive of disclosure requirements. They, they create sort of um, cornerstones of, of, um, of, of information and also of comparability. But there again, an important principle of sound risk management is that you can react to new information and you can react quickly. And obviously, whenever something gets regulated, regulated domestically, but even worse, internationally, with the time lags and uh, all the compromises that need to be done to achieve um, an international regulation, it, 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 there's a significant risk that it's just way too slow, way too static, and will lead to what, what is inevitable to, to basically missteering. Um, if we think about the, all the necessary technological developments um, uh, to, to, for the energy transition, also all the other adaptation <coughs> challenges, there, there's bound to be um, policies that look good today that in 10 years we'll look back and say this was a wrong path. This was, this was not effective or it didn't work. It made even maybe things worse. So um, I would advocate for um, allow sound risk management to basically do what is necessary and use the information, the information that insurance companies generate but also other uh, generate to, to help steer. And I okay. Hope, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Patrick. So, uh, Frank was yes and no, and we have Patrick, which is a definitely a no, more or less, right? More or less no. Because uh, if you have a disclosure, if you have disclosure of uh, 
the situations at risk, what you're saying basically is that there is a spontaneous price discovery mechanism that people will sort of put a price in this type of risk, and by paying with uh, their own money, uh, it will sort of create the right incentives to shift toward less carbon intensive and less risky types of setups, including in terms of our productive patterns and, and consumption. So it leaves a job with sort of relatively limited room for a maneuver, because you are the only one actually uh, who is a, a prudential regulator around the, the table. So what is, uh, what is your take in, in this? The floor is yours. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you, Fernando, for the invitation. It's good to be here with you this afternoon. Yes, I wear a couple of different hats. Um, I wear a hat of a prudential insurance regulator in Australia. I, as you heard, chair the Sustainable Insurance Forum, which is the counterpart insurance body to the NGFS that uh, Frank referenced, and we work closely together. The Sustainable Insurance Forum is made up of about 20 leading insurance prudential regulators and supervisors globally, and we collaborate to increase our uh, understanding and capability as it relates to climate risk. And I'm also a, a executive um, member, member of the executive of the IAIS, the Global Standard Setting Body for Insurers, and this is an issue, climate risk and the financial implications of that, that is occupying an increasing amount of the IAIS's agenda, which I'll reference in a moment. So as Patrick said, uh, this has been an emerging risk for insurers for 35 years, I think you said, and. Um, and people often think about climate risk uh, and its impact on insurers. Um, but of course, insurers in many ways have an ability to reprice and uh, in, in a number of cases only write um, annual renewable products. So um, you know, insurers, while there is an obvious impact, um, the impact uh, is being more broadly recognised as being systemic across the whole financial sector with implications for banks and investors, uh, perhaps much more acute than it is for insurers. But if I just return to insurers, insurers um, and the system as a whole, we typically think about these risks in three different ca categories. The first of those is uh, physical risk, um, Californian wildfires, but also supply chain interruptions from things like floods. We've recently had some pretty dramatic floods in northern Australia and in Queensland. Uh, the floods in Texas and Florida interrupted supply chains. Uh, in Thailand, um, in the last few years, floods in Thailand interrupted uh, motor vehicle manufacturing in, in Europe because of uh, component tree parts. Uh, so somebody's taking that risk, somebody's bearing that risk, and in some cases that risk is insured. Um, those transition risks um, can also be in change of regulation or technology or consumer preferences or indeed, as in the case of Australia, changing preferences with our trading partners, say China, and their appetite for uh, Australian resources, which lead to uh, you know, potential changes in valuation of assets, uh, in some cases impairment or changes to useful life of infrastructure, which needs to be recognised in accounts and impacts on uh, providers of credit and, and investors. Um, uh, changes to regulation, uh, the removing or banning of diesel taxis in the City of London and elsewhere in Europe um, has implications for, uh, for the providers of credit in, in those fleets. And we've heard reference uh, 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 Pacific um, Gas and Electricity, um, the now $50 billion. I hadn't heard that number, but that, uh, that is uh, probably, well, not probably, that is the world's largest climate-related uh, bankruptcy, and unfortunately, it won't be the last. So what is the IAS and the Sustainable Insurance Forum doing about this, and indeed agencies such as mine, um, APRA in Australia? Well, I think it'd be fair to say that in the last couple of years, like a lot of people in this room, we've been improving our awareness and capability of the issue. So um, the IAS, in partnership with the CIF, was the first global standard setting body to put out a, a, an issues paper on climate risk and its implications uh, for the insurance sector more, more widely. That paper was released in, uh, in the middle of last year, in, in June of, of 18, uh, well received. And that, that paper was designed to build capability, build awareness of, of the issues. Now, to the point of regulation, what we highlighted in that paper, that uh, actually the way climate risk manifests itself um, could be linked back to all the a number, I should say, a number of the insurance core principles, principles such as governance, risk management, investment, enterprise risk management, solvency, conduct and disclosure. So we didn't feel that uh, there is need for 
new regulation, in fact, the regulation that currently exists, uh, should be covering this, this lens. The issue for the firms that we supervise are our firms thinking about the risk and how the risk manifests um, in a way that, uh, that the regulation embraces. Um, given the awareness phase, um, we have worked uh, a lot with, um, with our peers in the, in the banking sector, and we've found that there is um, I think the bankers have found that the insurers are pretty good at modelling and thinking about things, and uh, and in fact there's a relationship between the pricing of risk and the uh, uh, and the price of assets, and uh, and that's been a, a good nexus. And we do a lot of cooperative work with uh, NGFS on that. There is a number of uh, bodies that. Um, uh, here in Europe, the high-level expert group, group, which is commissioned by the uh, EU to look at sustainability issues more broadly, has a lot of application for all sectors of the economy. In Australia, um, you heard from the Governor of the Reserve Bank, Philip Lowe, this morning. Uh, Philip chairs a group called the Council of Financial Regulators, which he referenced this morning. We have in Australia a working group of the Council of Financial Regulators on climate risk. Um, which in fact I chair, and that's made up of the conduct regulator, um, the Reserve Bank, the prudential regulator, in fact the government's Treasury Department, and we're ensuring that, um, that our actions are coordinated as we respond to this, this risk. Uh, Fernando and her, his team, um, uh, we, uh, in partnership with the Sustainable Insurance Forum and the IAS, we are going to publish this year an insights paper uh, on uh, modelling of, uh, of climate risks and indeed stress testing modelling uh, and how that, that applies to uh, the insurance sector and we're, we're looking forward to developing that capability. So there's great capability uh, being developed, great awareness being developed. I think it would be fair to say that, um, and I'm sure it's represented in this room, there is a range of, of understanding of this particular risk. What I have found with the, with the risk is the more you immerse yourself in this risk um, and understand the risk, the more important and the more serious and the more systemic uh, that, that it is from a cursory, uh, uh, yeah, a cursory um, oversight of it. So my response to regulation is there is one area where um, I don't think nudging uh, firms is enough, and that is to do with TCFD and disclosure. So uh, the Financial Stability Board's uh, um, Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures has been uh, incredibly successful. Um, it is it is being recognised as the as the global framework for that. Uh, there has been an encouraging take up of over 500 firms with eight trillion dollars worth of assets. My pushback on that is that that is a fraction of the number of companies worldwide, and it's also a fraction of the global assets. And while we should be encouraged by that. Um, uh, there is a much greater need for disclosure because you, governments, regulators, or indeed firms cannot make good decisions without appropriate information. So not only is there need for more people to be talking about this risk and disclosing this risk, but there is a need underneath that high-level framework that TCFD provides us with greater scaffolding of what does that mean uh, in terms of uh, taxonomy, measurement standards, uh, modelling, stress testing, and all those tools are relatively undeveloped um, uh, across most sectors, and until we invest more in this, um, uh, we are all collectively exposed. And so my um, uh, retort would be that disclosure, um, I don't think voluntary disclosure is going to get us there. So um, I think you will see in the not too distant future, and it has already occurred in some jurisdictions, uh, the mandating of more disclosure as it relates to um, uh, to this risk. Now, that is, won't just be coming from a regulatory nudge. There is uh, a very, um, in, in parts of the world, very active investor groups which are pursuing through the courts uh, actions around disclosure. There are activist shareholders which are demanding it. Um, there is, um, uh, you know, a, a consumer preferences around this which are changing the way people behave in terms of interacting with firms which is driving change. Uh, behaviour, and indeed the more forward-thinking and uh, innovative firms are indeed disclosing because they understand that until you actually disclose, you can't engage with, it, with a risk, and when you can engage with a risk, you can do something about it and turn it into a competitive advantage. Thank, thank you. So we have, you have heard several viewpoints. I think uh, you, you ended up with a sort of, uh, at least a proposal that in the area of disclosing, uh, it is necessary to have some form 
of, uh, of regulation that creates more than just, just the spontaneous incentive to reveal the exposure to uh, uh, financial risk associated with uh, climate change. But I think now it's uh, your opportunity in the uh, audience to uh, see which part of the argument uh, uh, convinced uh, you more. Uh, the uh, fact that uh, there is a, a movement uh, for spontaneously, not necessarily through regulation, uh, increasing uh, the uh, uh, way in which financial uh, risk associated with climate change gets into the uh, business? Or uh, is there uh, a need for uh, helping this uh, movement with some form of a uh, prudential regulation? Uh, I have uh, uh, your, you have your devices to, to vote. And uh, let's, uh, you have uh, 47. Let me encourage more of you to uh, participate in this uh, poll. And, oh, so uh, results uh, in uh, this panel. Do, the question is, do you think uh, climate change risk is receiving adequate attention and action by regulators and supervision around the world? Uh, the uh, answer that... Uh, you got uh, is no for uh, the vast majority. And uh, uh, so uh, let me have uh, briefly uh, our panelists comment on, on these uh, results. Just let me quickly uh, touch upon uh, to regulate or not to regulate. I, th I think we need uh, a better process. I, I clearly believe that more information is needed, more transparency, uh, understanding these risks. I think uh, you, for a proper risk management uh, of, the, of climate risk and environmental risk in general, clearly you need more information, more awareness. I would also say that there is a, a role to play in corporate governance. I think you have to involve stakeholders. You have to make them uh, aware of the trade-offs and make a decision. And I think that decision needs to be public and investors in general, either on the equity side or on the debt side, they need to know uh, what are the policies and where do uh, counterparts and corporates stand on different issues. So, so I do believe there is a disciplinary mechanism to be enforced. That includes more information, better risk management, and uh, in, involve uh, corporate governance uh, in, the whole, in the whole chain. I, I don't think that... Um, Tweaking uh, uh, risk weights would would do would do the trick. I, I think this is a more integral problem. Uh, we can even uh, think about other, not that it is similar, but analogous. Uh, for example, in in terms of smoking, uh, the question to eradicate smoking is not through risk weights uh, in uh, uh, in uh, in terms of uh, regulation. But you need information, you need awareness, you, and and you need. Uh, and investors also decide what the type of investments they want to have and what are the ones that they don't want to have. So I think compulsory disclosure is, uh, is an element where, where it could be uh, some uh, area uh, moving forward. So Frank, it, it leaves you with a, a scope of, uh, of activities now that uh, people need more, more awareness and, and more involvement. Well, well, thank you. I, th I think the, the um, I would I would probably distinguish between uh, prudential regulation on the one hand to make it very explicit and regulation more generally on the other. And my response has been that I see scope for regulation outside the prudential scope. Um, uh, that I think is is almost the easy uh, part of the answer. And there I advocated, you know, the climate law setting deadlines for, um, you know, um, the, the, the cars, uh, diesel cars being prohibited as of a certain deadline, um, office buildings having a, a C label or lower uh, being prohibited as of a certain. So these kind of laws, which is not prudential supervision, but we need uh, so that there is um, predictability uh, for the actors in the economy. Um, carbon pricing. Uh, and um, transparency disclosure. So these were the three areas outside the prudential space, which I do think uh, we need uh, regulation. Now, within the prudential space, um, um, maybe a way to phrase it would be, uh, don't ask what regulation can do for you, but ask what you can do without regulation. And my answer to that was <laughs> that you can do a lot without regulation. Now, why is that important? That is important because we are in a hurry. There are many things to be done. 
So if we all are going to focus on long-term um, and, and, uh, negotiations in, in, in risk phase and all that, uh, and we don't do all the things that are so obviously um, um, to be done, and I made a long list of that, I think it would be somehow um, um, wasting our time. Now, of course I know, Louise, that you know one and you do want me to say something about risk weights. Um, well, we, we, let, we have a panel of the, the second part of the panel. Oh, very good. So then what's up? I'll leave that. So your, your yeah. take on the, uh, on the uh, so, 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 audience's so, uh, views on this. Well, so first of all, Frank is my kind of regulator. So I'm <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, that is worrisome. I agree. I agree what, what uh, well, I have been a regulator once. So I'm a reasonable guy also in business. But um, he, I, I think... Um, I, I absolutely agree. There are, there is enough lack of predictability in this whole climate tra transition, and nature, and also economic developments, so, social developments that we are very hard to predict. So, creating predictability, at least of the legal framework, in the in the technical space, is certainly welcome and helpful. And I also agree that obviously the, the carbon price is a good instrument because it it is technology neutral. And it, it, it allows, again, for this sort of discovery of the most efficient um, technologies um, and most appropriate also technological and, and other responses, because not all will be solved by a technology. Um, I, 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 I remain um, actually, so, so given that this is a group of regulators and central bankers having 30% agree that there's enough is being done, I almost consider already <laughs> Um, a victory uh, for my argument, um, be, uh, because obviously there is a bit of of um, of, 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 of activism, uh, natural. You know, it's a, everybody likes to use the tools that they have, but I so, would still uh, um, I would still argue that a lot is already baked in. So if I take the prudential regulation that we are subject to, the Swiss solvency test, it requires you to consider all risks to your portfolio of assets and of liabilities. So the soon, uh, as soon as you, you know or you have to know that there is the climate change impacting your risk profile, you have to consider it. You have to hold capital for it. You have to charge for the capital. That will increase the price. So the mechanisms are already there. Um, on, the, on the nudging, whether nudging is sufficient for disclosure or not, I, I, I think it's hard to prove, the, uh, to prove uh, that, that it's, it's sufficient, but I would argue the proof should be the other way around. Anybody asking for more administrative burden on the financial services industry should somehow have, have a way to at least plausibly argue their case. It can't be just because it's a good thing and because, yes, somebody would like to know more. It had, there has to be a stronger case because oh, this, is, this is, doesn't come for free. And um, if I think of stakeholder pressure that also we are subject to and our own sort of survival instinct, um, we have an interest in, in furthering disclosure and in also furthering standardization of, of, of measurement. And, uh, and personally, I think this is sufficient, but I can't prove that it's sufficient. No, absolutely. So, so you're saying there is sort of a laughter curve in terms of the way you can, you can move forward. Geoff, so your, your take on the results of uh, the well, first, audiences? Uh, firstly, the 71% um, resonated. I, you know, it was a bit of a double negative, but I think the question was saying that regulators should, um, you know, should do more and should improve the, prove their understanding. I, I think that applies to... A society um, and the way we can do more and the way we can improve our understanding and our action is to have better more accurate data um, so uh, conventional wisdom said that you didn't get fires in the Arctic Circle conventional wisdom said that uh, Tasmania's old growth forests which have never burnt before would not burn they have burnt this year conventional wisdom said that a fire like occurred in California and the way that fire behaved uh, was not in anybody's models. There is a gap between the way the climate is changing and the uh, impact that that has uh, and the commercial flow through. There is a gap in, and lack of understanding. And uh, 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 Philip Lowe's um, 
Deputy uh, Guy de Bell made a very powerful speech in Australia overnight at which he distinguished the difference between cycles and trends as it relates to climate. And there's a tendency to rationalise climate events as cyclical uh, and, and miss the trend that is, a, that is occurring. And, uh, and we have a, a data deficit, and that data deficit needs to be closed if we are to appropriately address this risk and the systemic impacts that risk. What are regulators doing? The IAS and the Sustainable Insurance Forum are currently, as we speak, conducting a, uh, a survey of through our 20 member jurisdictions of the insurers in each of those jurisdictions about the implementation and maturity uh, as it relates to TCFD. Uh, we will publish that as the IAS's second issues paper later in 2019, which with a desire to improve practice, understanding and um, and evolution of, of this particular issue. So unlike Patrick, a, a bit of regulated entity, regulator tension, um, I, I still maintain that disclosure is, is where there is more, more nudge needed. Okay. So, so let's move to a sort of second uh, part, which will last for about half an hour of our, our panel. And uh, picking up on the doing more. Doing more can be, mean many things. Uh, it can mean, of course, disclosure, more information, what you are suggesting, uh, Jeff. But there are, let's say, the nitty-gritty areas of doing more through specific uh, regulation and particularly using uh, international uh, standards. So now, of course, we know that this is a very tricky issue, but I would like uh, each of you briefly to say, and Alejandro already mentioned that it wouldn't be your preferred way to sort of uh, tweak with uh, risk weights comparing green and brown, but could you sort of elaborate a bit on what are the pros and cons of uh, uh, doing this in, in, a, in, a, in a regulatory fashion? I, I think that there are, um, uh, and I tried to highlight at the beginning, that there are literally this is an ecosystem of things that you need to be doing. Uh, and it's not only on the, on the bank's balance sheet, it's um, uh, making people uh, fully aware of some uh, externalities that are not b uh, adequately being done today. Uh, for example, we, we, we don't even, we have uh, for, for a long time uh, for credit, credit bureaus and, and, and we don't have, uh, at least in, in, in Mexico, we don't have a good uh, bureau or environmental performance track record of companies uh, and with the type of uh, environmental um, uh, accidents or problems that they have had. And this is something that clearly needs to be priced in. Uh, I mean, this is the kind of risk that may translate into credit risk. And that is the kind of thing you, that you need to be uh, aware of and, and that you need to price. And uh, currently, it's not being done. And, and the question is, what can we do to have better information? And, and I think this uh, cuts across not only the financial industry. Clearly, we have to talk about the different uh, government agencies related with this type of track record with these type of uh, issues. And we need to uh, have methodologies on how to go about that and how to incorporate all, all of those uh, performances and track record into the pricing uh, of uh, different uh, uh, credits. I think it's not to target directly a uh, specific risk, but to understand better how those climate-related risks translate, translate into credit risk. And I think there we have a lot of things to, to be doing. And, and I would say that, um, in, in, in this, uh, this network for greening the financial system, I think there is a lot of enthusiasm uh, around that. And um, a, a large part of that enthusiasm is understanding better the problem. Uh, we had in January uh, a seminar, uh, 23 countries of the continent uh, participated. Uh, we profited from uh, a visit of the steering group of the NGFS. And, uh, and, I, and I think that shows that uh, there is awareness, there is uh, a lot of uh, engagement. And we need to have, uh, of course, there are a lot of principles that are being uh, gradually adopted in different countries at different speeds, but they are gra gradually being adopted. But I need to have, uh, I think we need to have a clear path on how information can be processed. And I think uh, the experience from the insurance industry is, is very valuable for, for, for the rest of the ecosystem. I think they started before. Uh, they have uh, more knowledge and more experience and more direct exposure to some of those risks. And, that, and I think we, sh we should profit from, from that knowledge. Thank you. Frank, so your take now on, uh, on, on these issues. And perhaps also I, I take that there is a sort of agreement that disclosure per se is something that is beneficial in any event. 
So uh, elaborating on that, your take on uh, the idea of uh, using more specific international standards for the purpose of uh, fighting climate change. Sure. Thank you. Um, there is this algorithm that says green is good and therefore less risky. And there's another algorithm that says brown is bad and therefore more risky. Both are wrong. Um, it's not a given. You can lose an awful lot of money investing in a green, you know, windmill park in wherever some Dutch pension funds know all too well. Um, so that is not um, the answer. That cannot be the answer. Um, but it's also not the end of the story. Because it might be that if we have better data, if we have longer, um, um, longer, you know, the bigger amount of years that we have data. And for example, within the NGFS, the Chinese tell me that they have, you know, certain, they've started to collect data already five years ago in certain subsectors of the credit market and everything. Um, if we have better data, it might be that certain credit risks that we are now all putting in the same bucket um, maybe don't belong there. So maybe certain green risks under certain circumstances are indeed le less risky than certain brown risks. At least intuition tells us that that might be the case. Um, so we need to collect this data. We also need, I think, to invest in more forward-looking risk management techniques, such as scenario planning and stress testing. Now, if data on the one hand and these forward-looking techniques on the other hand gives us insights that currently we don't have yet, showing that certain risks need to be differentiated that we now put it all in the same bucket, as of that moment, uh, we are not only allowed, but I think already under present um, regulation, we should make a difference in risk weights. But only then, and not just because green is good. Um, that would be my pitch on this issue. Thank you. Thank you. So in terms of more the credit quality of uh, the exposure, right? Exactly. OK. How would you, uh, Patrick, uh, uh, go about uh, in, in, in the insurance sector in terms of differentiation and whether there is uh, specific incentives on the regulatory side that you consider positive for advancing uh, this uh, reducing climate change related financial risks? So, so I think um, I, can't, I can't comment on the credit specifics because that's not so much a uh, a concern in in the in the insurance industry, on, and uh, even if we have credit insurance, it's typically it's short term or project related. But um, in general, I, I come back to w what I mentioned before: the these uh, at least uh, SST, but also uh, Solvency II as a framework, as a prudential framework, they require us to capture all risks. So there is no need for any. Um, in fact, it, it's, it's counterproductive to start tweaking. Um, I would argue let's eliminate the tweaks that we already have that may be subsidizing certain risks over others, and let's really um, just underpin the risks um, with, with the necessary capital. And it's, it's quite simple. I completely agree with Frank. It's not all green um, Assets or, or, or activity is is automatically less risky or vice versa, but uh, there are um, the, 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 when, when it comes to, to climate change, or there, there's this, this significant problem of the externalities of the CO2 emissions. So that's what needs to be addressed, but that cannot be addressed via uh, prudential regulation. That's sort of at the very end of the food chain. It should be addressed by trying to internalize this very, very significant externality. For the rest, I think we can trust that um, insurance uh, is basically, the price of insurance is a function of expected loss, and then there's a, a capital needed to cater for the uncertainty around that expected loss. And the better diversified the outcome is, um, the cheaper it is, and the less diversified it is, the more expensive it is. That's very simple. That's true for any insurance, and it's also true in this particular context. So if we just let the, the existing frameworks um, operate, but with honesty, then I think we will actually get a, a better outcome and also one that is more flexibly reacting to new information, which undoubtedly will, will emerge. So, uh, and Jeff, your, uh, your reaction now? 
Um, yeah, I mean, we, ha we are having... Um, we're having very polite conversations about climate change risk. Um, <clears throat> uh, there is a narrative that says we've got to try and mitigate the risk. We can't mitigate the risk. We are on a path to somewhere north of two degrees. So uh, what, we, what we have to do is, is ensure that um, that doesn't look like four degrees. Um, it's unlikely to look like one and a half. It's probably two. It could be something something more than that. And this is why I say that is not in the public so much in the public narrative. But you know, the Paris commitments were only 2.7 degrees. Um, people have drifted on the 2.7 degree commitments. So, um, so for us as a community, as a global community, we have to change a number of things. But three big systems have to change. The first of those is the power system. The second is the transport system. And the third is the agriculture system. To do that, uh, estimates are um, in the tens, hundreds of trillions of dollars over the coming uh, 10 to 20 years. The uh, capital for that to occur needs to, to be sourced. Um, so. I think as regulators, we need to make sure, and the IAS is fronting into this issue, where, in fact, insurance companies' uh, balance sheets only have 2.5% invested in infrastructure. Um, now, on that, if that projects forward, insurance companies are not going to be a great source of capital to solve um, uh, the challenges that, uh, that we face. So we're not saying we should incentivise green, but we are saying um, from an IAS perspective that we need to make sure that there aren't any undue penalties or obstacles to facilitate insurers investing in infrastructure. And we need to do that on an evidence-based uh, uh, you know, basis. Um, the World Bank has provided some information here. Rating agencies are also have good information here. Frank, you referenced some of the work China has done, which uh, I'm, I'm aware of as well. Um, and I think that's that's where I'd, I'd come at the issue. I'm, I don't think we're in, um, we're advocating incentives, um, but we need to make sure that there aren't any uh, impediments. Okay. So on on uh, the way in which uh, uh, regulators uh, incorporate uh, uh, directly uh, risk into their uh, frameworks, you've heard uh, nuances. Uh, you heard certainly that. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, need for uh, disclosure is, is, I think, a common understanding that the panel uh, has. But now perhaps it's also your chance to, uh, to say if, and let me ask you specifically uh, the, uh, the question uh, to you so that you can also give uh, uh, your opinion and the panel will uh, react. Uh, going, let's say, in this direction of uh, incorporating directly risks into international uh, regulatory standards, the question is, should these uh, international regulatory standards uh, be modified uh, to directly incorporate risks stemming from climate change? OK, so it's stabilized at 87. Oh, and uh, you have almost a sort of uh, equal uh, percentage of, uh, of you saying that, uh, indeed, there needs to be more uh, stringency in uh, international uh, standards, that they should incorporate uh, directly uh, green and brown uh, exposure. Now, it goes without saying that the definition of what is green and what is brown is it by itself a, a, an issue. But at least if we could do that, uh, half of you, almost, would be favorable of having a direct uh, inclusion of, uh, of this into the way in which uh, business is conducted in terms of uh, uh, requirements. So let me, uh, following this, see how uh, our, our, each of our panelists uh, react, uh, starting maybe with uh, uh, the uh, central banks and uh, monetary authorities on, on my left. Alejandro. Well, um, I will say that uh, this reflects that there is a lot of uh, uh, awareness, and and uh, and people are we are we are all worried about this. Probably in this uh, in this crowd, which is uh, very close to the regulation and understanding some of these uh, uh, details, 
probably that's why it was a very, very close call uh, in favor of uh, not using that instrument. It may be not necessarily the most suitable instrument for a very uh, well-intentioned and most needed uh, agenda that needs to be addressed. Uh, but I think it is very important that this discussion and having this on the agenda and on the window of regulators and uh, of central banks that uh, have a lot to do with the financial system brings the topic a little bit more awareness and, uh, and more attention than, uh, I mean, it has been receiving a lot of attention, but a lot of, uh, uh, it's, it's been highly uh, polarized and, um, and, uh, and I think that creates a complication for moving forward. And if some minimum common denominators can be agreed, I think that would be a very significant step forward. And just looking from uh, the agreement in this table, uh, I think it, there is very clear that we need more information. Uh, some of that information is not going to come on its own, so we really need to, need to know what kind of information must be done, even in a, in a non-voluntary approach. I think we have to make uh, people uh, aware and to take into consideration that information, and that may also need uh, a little bit uh, pushing towards that direction. And, and at the end of the day, that, that will help uh, move things along. It will not be a substitute of the hard political decisions, uh, more top-down, that need to be done on this issue. But at least it will be creating a more uh, fertile ground for, for probably these, or the, these, these uh, decisions to, to be made uh, uh, along the way. Thank you, uh, Alejandro. Since you're chairing the, the, the network for the, the last, uh, a little bit of a biased the last word on the panel, and uh, maybe move uh, to, to Geoff and Patrick to see your reactions to this equanimity in terms of should the uh, international standards incorporate directly uh, some of the climate change related risks. This is a tough, a tough call. So what, well, what uh, would you say about this and how would you go about doing this? Well, international standards is a very broad description, isn't it? So um, uh, I think I've you know, uh, said that on the one hand, as prudential regulators, and, and I speak as an insurance prudential regulator, many of the tools we already have are applicable to managing this risk uh, like many other risks. Um, the difference with this particular risk is that it's relatively unprecedented and how it behaves into the future is not well known. And in fact, the tools, the information, uh, and even model standards, taxonomy for thinking about that risk are under de underdeveloped in circumstances where it is a has systemic, uh, system-wide implications. So there is a degree of urgency uh, around that, um, which then comes to my point about the regulatory nudge to encourage uh, the development. Uh, that said, uh, here we are at the FSI uh, um, 20th anniversary conference having a discussion on climate risk. That may not have happened last year, the year before. Um, I know when NGFS was launched at the launch event, which I was at in April last year, Frank, uh, the comment was made that we had a room full of heavy hitting central bankers and uh, the fact that uh, everyone was in that room talking about climate for a day was almost unthinkable um, you know, 12 months earlier. So we have come a long way in a short period of time, um, but there is a degree of urgency uh, on understanding this risk. And uh, if this is my last opportunity for, to, to say something, and I, my plea would be that the more you engage with this risk, um, the more you under, understand the significance of the risk and the far-reaching nature of the risk and the way the risk is accelerating and the uh, very dramatic financial impacts on stability. And so um, I would just encourage those that haven't engaged fully and don't think they have an appropriate understanding of the risk to do so, uh, because it, it changes your, your, your perspective. Um, so I think I'm agreeing with the ratings that were, were, were put up there and that they perhaps reflect a range of understandings in the room. Th thank you, Jeff. So perhaps, perhaps Patrick... Uh a bit of your views on, uh, you were mentioning that, uh, yes, awareness is important, price discovery, this would all favor a movement, a natural movement towards correcting some of these uh, risks. But you saw that some of, some of the uh, members of the audience think that uh, a bit more is, is needed, so how would you sort of weight 
some of the difficulties of, uh, and perhaps some of the problems that uh, overdoing it might, might cause to the financial industry. So, so my hope is still that uh, the 50% are primarily banking type regulators because they have an international standard. Insurance doesn't even have an international standard. So um, we, it would be the domestic standards and or the, the regional standards. And, and I think I've, I've made my point that they are actually already sufficiently to cover all the, all the risks. I, I, I would argue, so the, the, I'm sometimes a bit nervous if I hear the insurance industry should fund climate adaptation. Because I don't think the insurance industry can fund something. The insurance industry is not particularly good at funding something. The insurance industry is particularly good at eliminating some volatility and using diversification to further eliminate some volatility. And we do have a lot of, in this transition, we do still have a lot of volatility. We have a lot of uncertainty, but we also have a lot of relatively certain volatility. And I would also advocate that the insurance industry has actually proven that it's quite resilient, even though it sometimes get, gets certain risks spectacularly wrong, and is really surprised by the magnitude of certain risks. Just take, take September 11th. That was never, ever modeled. And still, the, the insurance industry actually quickly integrated into the models, and there were also some limitations. But there were, there, were all, there were also new covers that emerged. And I mean, currently, we are struggling with cyber. That is our big topic. In, and I know we're not talking about cyber, but this is also one of these risks that we are sort of approaching and trying to understand what part is volatility, what part can be insured, and what part is just systemic and therefore needs to be more limited. And I would just encourage to let, um, to let, these, these, let insurance do what it does best and not try to nudge it into, into something that it doesn't, it doesn't do particularly well. Um, I, I think it's hard to disagree with the, um, with the transparency point or the, the disclosure point, because that obviously facilitates um, learning. Um, I, I would just caution that sometimes there, there are unintended consequences there as well. And so it, 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 it really re requires um, sort of a bit of, of a, of a sensible, sensible approach and the big the big levers are, in my opinion, outside of the financial sector. They are, they are in, in, in other policies, and the financial sector can, can be asked and can be used to contribute, but it can't be the, the, the starting point. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Frank, it leaves uh, you almost with a sort of a words of wisdom and, and, and conclusion. Uh, if, uh, if you had to sort of... Uh, reflect upon the various opinions that uh, uh, the panel has expressed, but also s what the audience has uh, suggested, which is a more direct action. Perhaps, yes, through, uh, in, in, with a, a little bias on the banking regulatory side, what would you sort of weight uh, in terms of, uh, of maybe a final word on, on, on this? Well, thank you, Louise. I thought it was the chairman of the panel that would have all this wisdom at the end. <laughs> but um, So the bar is being, being put up very high for me. Um, but I will try. And um, when I look at this, what seemingly seems to be a tie between 50 or whatever percent versus another 50 percent, I actually see 100 uh, percent through that. And that is 100 percent of people that didn't vote with their feet during the session. You all stayed here. Um, Nobody fell asleep, and it would seem to me that no one thinks this is a complete waste of time. And that is something very important. And I think, Jeff, you have been, um, you have been very um, um, good at doing the job that normally at these, uh, these, these gatherings, uh, you know, one would invite maybe a, a, you know, a climate scientist, and they would then devote 10 minutes to make all of you completely depressed. <laughs> and you did that to a certain extent, but it's necessary. <laughs> But it's necessary because the, 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 the world we are facing is very, very fastly galloping into a two degree plus world. And if you have read a little bit about that, and if you take away more, you know, the, the more, the more, the more, the, the, the most scary part, it's still very, very scary. And I think, Jeff, you, you have felt that. You've gone through that, 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 that psychological trough, so to speak. And you have risen up and said, you know, we need to do something about that. 
uh, and it feels as if most of you, if not all, have come to that point as well today. So that is a North Korean 100% vote. That's one. Um, second, uh, I think, Patrick, you have said a couple of times, and I agree, that financial firms already now need, under regulation, but even if we lived in a world without regulation, they would have to do that for themselves anyway, to manage all their material risks. We need no regulation to say you need to manage your cyber risk because, you know, it's material. The only thing that we now have to do is to understand, and I think we have come to that point now here, that climate risk is such a, a material risk that needs to be looked at, that needs to be managed by all financial firms. And, of course, then, need to be supervised um, as to how financial firms do that. And that is within our mandate. Um, and um, there's many things we can already now do. We can, and, and some of them have been mentioned by you, Alejandro. I've mentioned a couple of those. Um, you can look at the governance. You can look at the way the risks are managed. You can look at um, the SREP process. You can look at fit and proper testing. Actually, we do that. We ask, uh, you know, when people join the just financial sector and they go to, through a, financial, a fit and proper test, we do ask them about uh, climate risk management. Not because we expect that they are experts on this, but we want them to notice the very first time that they touch uh, us as a regulator or as a supervisor that they know that we think this is important. So there's a whole range of things that's already now in the regulation that just need to be fed uh, with this new insight. And that is that this is a, a real risk that we really need to worry about. And, um, and my plea was a little bit to just quote myself because you said I have to, uh, to look at all the uh, speakers, is that maybe climate is not the only thing. Maybe there is also biodiversity loss. Maybe there is water scarcity. Uh, and maybe all we have learned here today should also be applied there. So my plea would then be, um, and I understand in this house, that you know, um, when you think about regulation, um, and then especially also after the panel we had before, you, know, you start thinking about what can we do in, you know, in a, in a, in a Baalic war. Um, but there can also be, um, I don't know, maybe something like uh, the Baal core principles on climate um, um, risk management. So there are other ways, not just risk weights, but also how you do this in more in, a, in a terms of, of governance and expectations that you can have in which uh, maybe also this house can help financial firms around the world to get their hand on this very pressing, very depressing, <laughs> but very real problem. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, look, I think uh, you had uh, a wonderful panel that uh, made you aware of, uh, if made you more aware of uh, some of these uh, important uh, challenges that, uh, that we face. Uh, I think you, you saw that uh, there, are, there is actually more agreement uh, than disagreement, uh, even amongst uh, yourselves. Uh, I think uh, we, we, uh, we are uh, now uh, in uh, facing the important challenges that uh, require precisely the spirit of uh, uh, discussion, of cooperation uh, that uh, this, this house is all about and that uh, you represent in terms of uh, uh, coming here and participating in this uh, 20th anniversary of, uh, of uh, the FSI. So I, I would like to thank you very much for your uh, your attendance. I would like to uh, make a round of applause to the uh, to the panel, and thank you.